And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who just loves fast food. Hi, folks, and uh, welcome back to The Larry Miller Show. I'm Larry Miller, but in a way, aren't we all? And boy, oh boy, it's a gorgeous day here on the mainland. I am not on Milleronia today. Colonel Jeff and I are on the mainland for a few good reasons that I'll be telling you about. But boy, oh boy, is it ever a pretty day. And of course, that that music always gets better every single week, and it makes me happy, and it makes Colonel Jeff happy. That, of course, is the Alex Alvarez Orchestra and the Larissa Juarez Dancers, featuring boy tenor William Lucking, asking the musical question, Is spending the day at the DMV an acceptable substitute for a trip to the volcano? William, it's not only acceptable, it's such a great substitute, in fact, for a trip to the volcano that, you know what, Colonel Jeff and I have both agreed to make it a trip to volcano number three. That's right, we're going to call the DMV, spending the whole day at the DMV, a trip to volcano number three. As well as many of you know, I think as all of you should know, we have two working volcanoes here on Milleronia. Well, we're not there today, but on Milleronia, we have two volcanoes. And when our citizens or an unacceptable guest come to Milleronia, we, that is I, will immediately sentence them to a trip to volcano number one or volcano number two. Volcano number one, as you know, is, uh, well, it's a, well, it's, it's no picnic. It's a trip he gets uh, escorted and has to be dragged, ultimately, up to the volcano there, num- volcano number one. And then, uh, well, the guards toss him in. Every so often, we, well, we'll always give him a minute to make his peace. And uh, sometimes he finishes that on the way down. But you know what? Uh, that, that volcano boy, like volcanoes, that is a working volcano. And uh, he gets tossed in. And 15 feet later, there is no him. And uh, volcano number two, if you can imagine it, is worse than that. Volcano number two has outcroppings and almost little gargoyles on the way going down. So you bump your head, you bump your knee, you bump your arm. And then also you, that rock is very hot. The lava is lower, much lower than volcano number one. But it's no picnic again. Because all the way on the way down, you know, the rocks are hot. And you feel the temperature growing hugely. It's immense. And so by the time you hit the vol, well... By the time you hit the lava in volcano number two, you're almost happy for it. Not quite, but almost. It's not. After all, once again, that's on our on our plaque outside there. And as I've said already today, our plaque says, there's no picnic. And yet, so I have to tell you, boy, William, that was a heck of a question is spending the day at the DMV an acceptable substitute for a trip to the volcano? A, yes. B, it is now officially volcano number three. Yikes. And uh, I, by the way, I've been to the DMV many times, and uh, you have too. Everyone listening has. And I have nothing against them, and I like the people there a lot. And, well, when you've got to go, you've got to go. I suppose that saying works for a lot of things. But you know what? I've spent some time at the DMV, but not the whole day. I mean, you can spend a half hour there or an hour. And if it's a big line for one window or another, sometimes, well, you know, you can spend an hour there, an hour and 15 minutes. But 
it's uh, it doesn't ruin your life. It doesn't ruin your day. It's hey, it's the DMV, and these folks work there, and they're going to help you when you get up to that window. But the full day there, they can't help you that much. In fact, they themselves would almost walk away holding their hands up and saying, "Buddy, I'm afraid you're on your own for this one." And by Amazon, PayPal, and my book. That's right, three of the greatest companies we have here at the Larry Miller Show. First of all, I love Amazon again. Now, the greatest company in the world. No other company in the world does the three things they do. Number one, they order anything you want. Anything you want. B, they already have it there. They don't even have to order it themselves. They don't have to make it. They don't have to borrow it. They don't have to do anything. They've got it all ready for you. They've got one of those warehouses, boy, oh boy, like Indiana Jones, where it's a mile long and a mile wide and a mile high and a mile deep. Boy, oh boy, as you can imagine, that's a big warehouse. And so you know what? Amazon has that. No other company has that. And the thing is, number three, the thing they have that's the best of all, they send us a percentage of whatever you order. That's right. Whatever you want, whatever enters you, your head, well, whatever you can imagine, they send us here at the Larry Miller Show a percentage of whatever you want. And we take that money, boy, oh boy, folks, we take that money, they always send it in cash, which makes me like them even more. And uh, we take that money as soon as it gets here to the studio, and we put it in, well, a big steel box you know, a, a, a big safe box, and we close it because, of course, we save that for our next big fancy fried chicken dinner with two drinks beforehand in a different place. So I like Amazon, and I like the way they do things. And you know what? So go to Amazon, for goodness sake. Don't go yourself, though. We'll take you there. You don't have to do anything elaborate like, well, how, what do I have to type in on my laptop or my iPhone or whatever I do? You know what you do, folks? Go to our website, LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> that, of course, <laughs> that's our website on Mars. <laughs> Colonel Jeff always puts, a uh, well, uh, just great sounds together there. And I thank him for it. And you do too. But you know what? You do that. You go to our website. We have a banner there that says Amazon. You click our banner and we'll get there. You could click the, click the Amazon banner and then go take a nap. Wash your hands and face completely. And then, you know, go to your big fancy lazy boy chair that's so comfy and lie down in it. And heck, you know what? Pull a quilt up with you. You can take your sneakers off and and just stretch your toes in your in your white gym socks there, and uh, get on that chair and pull the pull well, pull the quilt over you, and take a nap. Whew. Boy, it sounds pretty good as a matter of fact, doesn't it? And uh, we'll get you there. We'll get you to Amazon, and by PayPal. That's right, PayPal. Boy, that's another great group. They make you feel like you're saving the world. You know what, folks? And so you do that. Uh, same thing happens. The same thing. Go to our website, LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> of course. <laughs> that great stuck in traffic horn on, well, one of the Milleronia ships. And uh, you do that, though. Go to pay PayPal has a banner, too. Hit that banner. And uh, you know what? If you enjoy my show, and why wouldn't you, and you'd like to send a few bucks to help out, and why wouldn't you, you can send it through PayPal. They're great to work with. And especially with, between me and Colonel Jeff, you know, instead of saying donate or pay what you like, I like to say things like buy us some drinks. That's a much much nicer way to think of it. So because, you know, there are different levels. Level one through five, all the way up to... We're driving to Florida! <laughs> yeah.
Yes is right. And of course, that's all the happy people at the DMV helping out by by saying, we, we'd like to help you out too, and uh, Mr. Larry. And you know what? If you can just get us out of here... But help us if you would help us if you want. I I can't get you out of the DMV, and uh, you know what? So look for the PayPal banner on our web website, and and by me. That's right. Signed hardcover copies of my book, Spoiled Rotten America, are now for sale at store dot comedy film nerds dot com. I'm very proud of that book. I loved writing it. I worked mighty hard on it, and it's funny, and it's a good look at life through my eyes. And you know what? Now you're going to like it. So uh, thank you in advance for all that good stuff. And you know what? That makes me think I'm so happy. I want to talk about one of the things that, that makes me happiest, which is baseball. That's right. You know what? It's too rare, especially at a time in, well, in America where... I don't know if you've noticed, but there's an election going on, and I I, I don't talk about it. I, I I may have mentioned it once or so, but I it, it's making me well nauseous. It makes me I I can't take it. I don't know how you feel, but I there's oh there are so many other better things to talk about, and even though it's only well about well, well a little less than a week before the actual election. <sighs> <laughs> did I do that out loud? I did. But there's so much more fun in talking about baseball. The World Series. Oh, Game 7. You know what? As a couple of sports writers have already written down, and they're right, uh, the two most wonderful words in all of sport just might be Game 7. Because uh, that's one of the reasons Colonel Jeff and I are are back in town on the mainland, and we just felt it was a well, it was a little nicer, a little better to watch Game Seven from well, Country Seven. I know, I know, I'm not sure what that means either, <laughs> but I said it so there. But boy, oh boy, folks, you know there are. I love all the traveling I've done. I've been to many places in our country and many places throughout Canada and in Europe. And you know what, folks, though? Nothing better than baseball. And I love Chicago. I really do. I really love Cleveland the same way. I'm not just saying this. I'm not a big fan of either of the teams. But boy, oh boy, I'll tell you what, number one, Cleveland is one of the greatest cities in America. And uh, that's one of the reasons, well, I, th I think that's one of the reasons they get named and used in so many movies. Major League is one of my favorite movies of all time. And uh, that's set in Cleveland with the Cleveland Indians. It's terrific. It's a great movie. And, uh, and you know what, by the way, in Cleveland as well is the house from A Christmas Story. If you know that movie, and you ought to know it, it's a great movie, too. Oh, boy, with Darren McGavin and uh, oh, so many other great actors. But you know what? That, ha that film is set in Cleveland, number one. Written by Gene Shepard, and it's oh, a great writer from there. And you know what, though, uh, folks? There's, uh, whenever I go to Cleveland, uh, people say to me that, you know, the house from A Christmas Story is here. It's in Cleveland. And I say in my act every single night there, I say, you know what, folks? I know that the house from A Christmas Story is in Cleveland, but I think what you may be missing is that the reason that's so great and the reason the movie is so great is not because the house is in Cleveland. Folks, it's because Cleveland is in that house. And I feel that with all my heart. And people like hearing it because it's true. And boy, oh boy, and the Indians are a terrific team. And tonight is Game 7. But boy, I feel the same way about Chicago. You know, it's a terrific city. It's so much fun to be there. I always love, I don't know if they still have this, but when I was younger, I used to love that you could go to one bar and it closes at 3 in the morning. But just across the street 
is another political zone, I guess. And those bars close at four. I'm not I, I'm not even sure that still happens there, but I used to think that was neat. I thought, how do you like that? Get a load of these folks. I just like that they do that. Now, what does that mean, that you have to go to a local council member and say, can I keep my bar open an hour later? And, oh, by the way, here's a shoebox full of 20s. I mean, is that... I don't know, but it's a wonderful city with terrific folks in it. And boy, oh boy, I am glad both cities, as you must know, uh, are just over the moon because they're in the World Series. And you must have heard these statistics, but I'll say them once more for you. In Cleveland, the Indians have not won a World Series since 1948. And in Chicago, they haven't won a World Series since 1908. And they're both just over the moon happy. And I think it's going to be a terrific game tonight. And and, as some sports writers said, hey, you know what? Extra innings. Why not? And can you imagine that? Yeah, that's right. Everybody, everybody in both of those cities would just, you know, their eyes would roll and they just, (laughs) because they're as happy as they could be. But at any rate, folks, watch some baseball tonight and love some baseball tonight. And watch how those managers, good Lord John Madden and Terry Francona, if Terry Francona chews more gum, I, I, I'll tell you, someone someone in his family must say, Terry, God bless you, but stop with the gum. But he's a great manager. He used to be with the Red Sox. And John Madden, boy, oh boy, that fella, how he handles his players and brings players in and out and works his bullpen. Folks, this is real baseball, and I hope you like it as much tonight as my wife and I and Colonel Jeff like it too. In fact, in fact, we love it. So take me out to the ball game. Yep. Take me out to the park. I think that's the original lyric to the park, the ballpark. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jack. How many people know that Cracker Jack is not plural, by the way, in that song or in it as a product? It's not Buy Me Some Peanuts and Cracker Jacks. That's not the name of the product. The name of the product is Cracker Jack. I don't care if I ever get back for its root, root, root for the fill in your team. If they don't win, it's a shame for it's once, twice. Three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Well, maybe I blew the words there, too. Hang on, is it for it's one, two. Three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Whew, the old ball game. Of course, those are from the days when you had a full three-piece suit on at the ball game, whether you were, uh, you know, whether you were a man or a kid. I like that, too, though. Anyway, I hope you like the game, folks. And that brings me to my favorite part of the show, the joke of the week. (laughs) Well, this is a great day. Everything's making me happy today. I hope it is for you, too. Well, this is a great joke. Uh, Colonel Jeff and I both liked it, that uh, a 90-year-old man is a great golfer, and he loves it very much. And he comes back from a, a brisk round of golf one day, and he says to his wife, you know, honey, I'll tell you, I I, I just may have to give up golf. I, I don't know uh, anymore. And she says, why? You love it. Don't, don't just give up something you love so much. And he says, I can't see the ball when I hit it. I still swing really well, and I get good contact. I, I'm, I'm even getting better at the whole game, but I, I can't see where I hit it anymore. And she says, oh, I see what you mean. And then she suddenly says, hey, wait a minute. Why don't you take my brother Pete with you? And he says, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is, I'm 90 and your brother Pete is 103. Why in the world would I ask him to come along? And she says, because he has the greatest eyes in the world. You know that. Best eyes in our whole family and, and all everywhere you go, Pete has the best eyes in the world. He'll see 
whatever you hit, wherever you hit it. And you know that. And her husband said, well, to be honest, that's true. You know, uh, it's not such a bad idea. Sure enough, the next time he goes out, which is very, very soon, he calls his brother-in-law Pete, and Pete and Pete's very happy to be asked. And he says, sure, I'll come along, and uh, you know what? I'll I'll see that ball wherever you hit it. They do that. They get up at the, at the, at the first tee, and uh, our 90-year-old friend, Lines things up and hits that ball. Hits it beautifully, too, by the way. Right down the heart of the fairway. Oh, it's as straight and as far as it could go. And uh, he's thrilled. And he says, calls out to Pete. And, he's, and he says, uh, wow, that was a good shot. Pete says, that was a great shot off the tee. And and he says, uh, did, did you see it? And Pete says, I, did I see it? I sure did. It was the best shot I've ever seen. And I, I know exactly what it is. Well, wow, really? Great. Where did it go? And Pete says, I don't remember. <laughs> so he he saw it, and it was the best shot ever hit, and he knows exactly where it went, but, well, bless his heart, he doesn't remember. So I hope those two fellows uh, stopped off at the bar at the golf course. Because I think just about every golf course in the world has a bar back where where well where you come in near the parking lot. But boy, there you go, folks. That's a <laughs> that's a good theme about life in general. Where did it go? I don't remember. And that brings me to my second favorite part of the show: the poetry corner. Maybe a string quartet could come in handy at the DMV. You know what? Calm people down, give them something to watch as they spend 14 hours sitting in the red plastic chairs. But uh, you know what, folks? This is a this is a good poem. A poem mean uh, poems mean a lot to me when they're terrific. And Colonel Jeff is the same way, and I hope you're the same way too. When then you know what? A good poem is like a good joke, and I'm uh, I'm glad that Colonel Jeff found this one. It's called November by Thomas Hood. Uh, Thomas Hood was born in London, and he lived from 1799 to 1845. He was a poet, author, and humorist. He wrote for many magazines like Punch, the great English humor magazine, and he later published a magazine of his own poetry and works. And I'll bet you this one would have been in it. It's called November by Thomas Hood. No sun, no moon, no morn, no noon, no dawn, no dusk, no proper time of day, no warmth, no cheerfulness, no healthful ease. No comfortable feel in any member. No shade, no shine, no butterflies, no bees, no fruits, no flowers, no leaves, no birds. November. And that's so nice. It's Colonel Jeff and I were saying before the show started. Of course, if we said it during the show, you'd have heard us. But you know what? We really did say that it's a wonderful poem that uh, Thomas Hood found a way with his words to start by making it sound like it was, whoa, I don't like November at all. And that's the way it's, oh, there's no this, there's no that, da, da, no dawn, no dusk, no no warmth, no healthful ease, no comfortable, no, no shade. No, and, and, but suddenly you realize, well, he gets kinder with it, and then he says a little celebration just by saying, November. And I think that's lovely. That's a great way to look at life, too. But boy, oh boy, folks, November is a terrific month, and we're in it now. And uh, whew, coming up to Veterans Day, coming up to 
oh, that election thing that that should make us all at this point go. Ugh. And uh, you know what, though? November's a great month. Thank you, Thomas Hood. And that brings me to my third favorite part of the show. MMM, Triple M, the magic movie moment. Boy, that theme sounds great, too. I'm just jolly. That's what we should have. Maybe maybe we should have a bar at every studio we have. <laughs> maybe we should do that, too. What are you two doing in here? Oh, well, honey, we uh, we finished the show for the day. For the week, you know, it's a weekly show. Slam. <laughs> anyway, folks, the magic movie moment is also very meaningful to me. And uh, this is a great movie. Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, from 1964. Boy, oh boy, talk about someone who made a movie. This is directed, produced, and written by Stanley Kubrick. I think it's fair to say the great Stanley Kubrick. So many wonderful things he's made. And uh, starring, what a cast. Peter Sellers, George C. Scott, James Earl Jones, Sterling Hayden, Keenan Wynn, Slim Pickens. There's so many others, folks. But And talk about talent. Peter Sellers was always great, magnificent. All of these actors were fabulous, by the way. But Peter Sellers, in Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, plays three characters. He plays the English... Captain, I think he is. I'm sorry, I can't remember his name right there in the movie. And and uh, he, he plays, uh, well, he plays Dr. Strangelove. And, uh, boy, he has so many great scenes and so many. And he plays the President of the United States. I almost forgot. He's so talented. He was so great. God bless him. But you know what, folks? This is an interesting magic movie moment for me. And, it's, by the way, all true. When uh, my kids were little, and I think they were oh, about four and seven, and my wife uh, had gone shopping after work, and she was going to come home in a little bit, so we decided to watch something on TV together. And a good thing to do is always watch an old movie, boy, with your kids. You know, it's just a great thing. And we flipped around, and sure enough, on the, uh, I think it was Turner Classic Movies, we flipped around, and what's on but Dr. Strangelove. And it's such a great movie, and it's so well made. And we start watching, and the kids loved it too. And it comes up to that scene in the bomber, in the warplane, where the pilot, Slim Pickens, and, by the way, James Earl Jones is one of the crew. And uh, he's, in, he's in the back there, and the crew is getting ready because they have their assignment now. They're going to fly right into Russia, and they're going to drop their big bomb. That gigantic hydrogen bomb they have. And so, you know, boy, oh, I remember from that scene, and Slim Pickens, as you know, is great in everything, too. Just a wonderful fella and a great actor. And he passes out to each crew member what the Air Force puts on the plane there in case they're going into trouble, into a battle zone. He passes out each... Each of them has, it's a little box, and each box has in it, and he's reading it from the pilot's seat there. It says, let's see here, there's a, there's a hundred dollars in cash, and uh, two condoms, and uh, well, uh, a book on how to mix alcohol, and a bottle of whiskey. And then he says, shoot, a fella could have a pretty good time in Vegas with this thing. And then at that point, well, at that point, he, my wife came home with the two bags of groceries, and uh, she walked in the uh, garage door, which is right against our den there where the TV was on, and she came in, and so I, you know, I got up and said, hi, and hi, honey, and then, you know, just took the bags to help her in, and she, 
She, I'll never forget. She just glanced at the TV and saw Dr. Strangelove on and then gave me a look because the kids were just watching it. She, was, she gave me a classic parenting look of, really? This is, this is what you feel is a good thing for them to be watching Dr. Strangelove? And, uh, and then she goes up and just shaking her head. And uh, that's the part of that scene, by the way. It's just great because there they go into Russia and they're going to drop that bomb. And Slim Pickens, you know, pushes the button for the bomb bay doors to open. But they don't open in the movie. They, they're they not fixed. They're not working. And he tries everything else. He, you know, he flicks every switch and and, and pulls every lever and what I used to do, folks, with the kids, after we saw that scene, and of course in the scene, well, he fixes that bomb and it drops and the, the, the movie comes to an end there with a, that great old English song, The We'll Meet Again, Don't Know Where, Don't Know When. And uh, folks, every time I drove them to school after that, for, oh boy, more than a year, another hundred times, two hundred times, they wanted me to tell that story of that scene, and I was happy to do it. So we're in the car, and I describe, would describe how, oh, and then, uh, and then the major, the pilot, that Slim Pickens, remember, and, and he, uh, well, he couldn't fix it. He couldn't fix the Palm Bay doors. He was trying to flick all the switches up there in the cockpit, and then he said, uh, oh, well, you know what? I've got to go do this myself. And he uh, takes his headphones off, takes the helmet off, and puts on his cowboy hat, and because that's what he's most comfortable in. And he climbs into the back and says to the co-pilot, "Right, you watch this," and says to all his men, "All right, you know, keep a good lookout." And he and he goes into the back into the bomb bay, and well, the doors are not open, and the bomb is just sitting there, and he sees just above the bomb. Well, the panel of wires and electricity are sparking. They're broken somehow. They're not doing whatever their job is, and which is to open the bomb bay doors and to drop the bomb. And he so he climbs up on the bomb and he's uh, he's sitting on it and he's reaching up. And he, folks, he does. He takes one of those tools out there and he disconnects every wire that needs to be. And he's working on it and just, you know, click, 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 and he puts it back together again. And sure enough, wouldn't you know it, the second he clicks that last wire into place, the the bomb bay doors open. They, and they slowly, and he's just, woohoo! He's, you know, happy, and those doors open up, and he did it, and he fixed it. And then, well, of course, once the doors open, the next thing happened, which is the bomb goes. The bomb falls. The bomb disconnects, and it's on his, its way with Slim Pickens still sitting on it. It's a great scene, and he, he, he's going down fast. That bomb goes, whoa, those go pretty fast, and they go down and down, and he's waving his hat. It's like he's riding a steer. He's going, woo-hoo, And uh, he and the bomb start to disappear. And then, well, in the movie, they, <laughs> well, the bomb explodes. And the song comes on. And then when that bomb explodes, well, you're not going to be, <laughs> you're not going to be writing a memoir after that. And, uh, well, it explodes. It, it knocks off the whole city, explodes the whole city it was going after. And then that song comes up, we'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when. And then a zillion other bombs go off. They have films of, because that started, well, a, a nuclear war. And there's so many other bombs going off. It's, it's a wonderful movie anyway, in all sorts of ways. But when I retold the story each time in the car on the way to school, well, I would change that. They're four and seven. They don't... They don't necessarily have to have that underlined. So I would always say that, and he fixed it, and the bomb, and, then the, and the bomb just, you know, he fixed that too, and it just disconnected. And you know what? That major, Slim Pickens, was such a good pilot, he could fly that bomb too. Not just the plane, but he, he turned that bomb around, and he flew it right back to base. 
And then we'd always get to school and, well, I'd say what I meant, what I knew, which is, you know what? This is, uh, I love you. Have a great day. It's wonderful and wonderful. I'm glad you like that story. And maybe, just maybe, I'll tell it again tomorrow. Those things like that, like, well, well, you know what, folks? The, the, a great movie like that with a great scene that then becomes a story for the family. That's my magic movie moment for today, for this movie. It's a great movie. See it if you haven't. See it again if you have. Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. And I remembered a few things yesterday. And they matter. It's, uh, you know, when the last time I had a Caesar salad was, I, I don't, don't even remember. I'm not even crazy about them. But I went to the post office in our area here, because remember, I'm not on Milleronia now. I'm back on the mainland, and I went to our post office, and I got one of their big padded bags and put one of my books in it and uh, that someone wanted for uh, one of the one of the brain trauma associations and foundations and they wanted to give it away as an award and as my wife said award for what and i said but i don't know how would i know it's 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 award for being a good guy in the brain foundation having your brain grow i don't know i wrote it it's a good funny award and after that Folks, it was about, oh, four o'clock yesterday, and I hadn't had lunch yet, and I decided to go to Dupar's. That's a, well, there's a, a chain. I don't know how many of there are, but uh, it's spelled D-U, and then another word, P-A-R-S, Dupar's, and they've been around a long time, and it's a charming place to go, though. I never get there. It's wonderful to be there. It's, if... Mayberry had a sort of a nice, you know, a nicer restaurant. You know, uh, it would be Dupar's. It's a great family place to go to. And by the way, all the black and white photos they have on their walls make it look just like that, because that's what it is. They have shots of this. Well, here's Dupar's in 1949 in the same spot. And when you go there, folks, I'm telling you, in those photographs. Or anytime you go there, if it's a Sunday brunch or if you want to go on a Tuesday at dinner, every single customer looks just like the ones in those photos. And that's a nice feeling. It's, yeah, I, be, I think it's a little like Mayberry. And you know what? The uh, waitress, at the time I go there, which is 4 o'clock, well, there's no one, almost literally no one in there. It's in between their lunch and dinner. And, well, the, the folks who go there aren't going to split meals like that. You know, they'd, they'd come at lunchtime or dinner time. But I, I, as I said, I hadn't had lunch, and I hadn't been at two pours in years and years, long time. And I sat down there, and the waitress came over, and she was very nice. And in uniform, they wear Dupar's uniforms. And the waitresses have, well, you know, a uniform with a little name tag that says Irene and she's just wonderful. And I said to her, you know what? Uh, I'd like a... And I saw on the menu it said traditional Dupar's meals. And it had uh, chicken pot pie. I never like chicken pot pie. But it's one of those foods that every six years you say to yourself, hey, how about a chicken pot pie? Boy, that sounds good. And then, of course, you eat it and realize, I don't like these. But... You know what I said that day? I said, let me have a chicken pot pie, please, Irene. And she said, all righty. And she starts to write it down. Then she le leans in and kind of whispers like it's a secret. She said, you know, these take 25 minutes. Just wanted to let you know. And I said, oh, boy, I'm glad you did. You know what? Thank you. But let's forget the chicken pot pie, and I'll just order something regular. But And she said... Yeah, sorry, I didn't want to ruin, ruin it. I said, there's nothing ruined. You help me here. 25 minutes is too long to wait for a chicken pot pie. Because in my case, it's 25 minutes plus six years. And at any rate, though, 
I said, you know what? Uh, I'll have a the vegetarian burger, please. And I didn't get fries. I got coleslaw with it. And then I said, and a Caesar salad. I'd like uh, a Caesar salad, uh, please. And she said, would you like anything on it? And uh, because they have options, of course, of chicken or oh, salmon you can put on the Caesar salad. And I didn't. And I said, oh, you know what I'd like, though? Give me the, uh, and the word went out of my head. I love these things. And I'm telling you, it's, it's, she said, oh, what, 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 what are you looking for? And I said, it's the, the, uh, uh, fish, a little brown fish. It's a little, little salty brown fish. And, uh, I can't remember the name. Isn't that silly? I can't, she said, oh, let's see. I don't, I don't think I know the name either. And I said, oh, isn't that odd? I did, I said it begins with an A. I, 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 I think, and for goodness' sake, and it ends in an I or a Y or, or or something like that. And she just couldn't remember, and I couldn't remember. I said, "Isn't that ridiculous? I must have said this word. I must have said this word a billion times in my life, and I must have looked forward to having it. Oh, for goodness' sake!" And she said, uh, "No, just let's see." Uh, it's either the chicken or the, or the salmon. I, I know we have. And I said, no, 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 thank you. I, I said, oh, I want these things. Isn't that silly? Just ask the chef, please, to put those things on it. Maybe he knows what those things are. I, he'd have to know what those things are. And uh, she said, oh, I don't know. And I said, just bring me, uh, bring it with, it with him. Without him, it doesn't matter. And I couldn't remember the name. And you know what, folks? As she came back and I had... It was very nice, a vegetarian burger there and the coleslaw, and I was feeling so happy, and I saw the Caesar salad, which I don't really like anyway, but I had a couple of bites of the, the lettuce there, and uh, and I was feeling so relaxed and so good at this nearly empty Dupars at four in the afternoon, and I I felt so good I got myself a Coke, a large Coke with plenty of ice, because that's what I like, and it's not good for me, but you know what? I was feeling crazy, and she brought a big glass pitcher. Oh, they, they do them up so nicely with a straw in it, large Coke with plenty of ice, and I twirled it around a little bit and stirred it. I sure did like that, and and I had it, and I, I drank some Coke with this as I went through the meal, and every time every time I, I picked through the salad, I said, what in the world is that? So I had my phone with me. As I suppose we all do at this point. Sometimes we feel too guilty about leaving it in the car. And I said, you know what? And I just uh, texted a friend of mine, and I said, just no hellos, no, gee, how are you? Or here I am at Dupar's. Or I just uh, I just texted to him, what, are the, what do they call those little brown fish on uh, the top of a Caesar salad? And uh sent it to him and just kept looking over and he didn't send anything back. Well, he could be at work. He could, you know, be doing, he does a lot of good work. And uh I said, well, there you are. Okay. And I got almost through the home and she came over by the way and she looked at my Coke again and said, you want a little more Coke? And I said, yes, I do. And she brought me another Coke with plenty of ice and fresh Coke in a fresh glass. Boy, I sure did like that. And then, you know what, as I got to the end of the meal there, and, and I'm enjoying myself. I'm alone. It's quiet. They don't have TVs in this place. There's nothing on taking up your time and your space. And they had newspapers there and a big, uh, oh, and a big bundle and a big bin. You could just grab one and even I said, no, and I always grab a newspaper. But now I was, oh, no, who needs one? Forget it. Just sit there smiling. And I, then I uh, just checked my phone again. And sure enough, my friend had gotten the message. And he wrote back to me. And, and uh, that was it. I uh, Oh, and I actually said out loud, oh, oh, of course. And then a minute or so later, when the waitress came by smiling, I just looked up I looked up at her and said anchovies anchovies 
And she smiled and laughed and said, oh, and she, and she said the same thing. She said, anchovy, anchovies. And I said, isn't that something? My friend, and said, anchovies, anchovies, back and forth. And then she said, we don't have those either. But I said to the, I said to her, oh, thank you. But that doesn't even matter. It's just nice to remember it. My friend remembered it. He knew, to, knew it right off the bat here, and he just sent it to me. And by the way, folks, for the record, the friend I sent it to is your friend, too, and he's right here now. It's Colonel Jeff Fox, and he knew it in a second. And you know what? Of course, anchovies. Anchovy, for goodness sake. And he and I talked about it. Maybe you feel the same way. Anchovies get a bad rap. And uh, growing up, he used to say, well, for him, it was just a weird thing to put on pizza. A little fish, and then then he said, but then I eventually had one, and they're fantastic. Little salty brown fish. Well, they were also used for bait, but <laughs> but that doesn't help their curb appeal. You know, just to say that, as he said, but uh, it reminded me a story of anchovies. Because I enjoyed that meal so much yesterday, Dupars, and I paid the nice waitress and uh i walked over to the counter there. there's still nobody there and their head big head counter is at there where their pies and cakes and donuts are and dupars makes some good pies and cakes and donuts and she smiled at me behind the counter and i smiled at her and uh, she said would you like something from here and i said no no thank you but i said uh I'll bet everyone who comes here to eat walks past this counter and has to stop and take a look. Don't they? All the folks, and she she smiled and said, yes, they do. They all do. And I said, well, I'll bet they do. It looks terrific. And no thank you today. None for me. And then I said, hey, what's that one? You know, that's the, which, of course, is guaranteed. And uh, what's that one called? She said, oh, that's a butter bun. Which sounds like something, by the way. It sounds like a, a, a nickname for someone in 10th grade. Hey, butter buns. But you know what? It looked pretty good. It was a big round thing. It was a single unit thing for one person or two people. And then, and it was uh, covered with sliced almonds and some other little small kind of nut. And they were all held on there by uh, some kind of clear sauce or clear frosting. Sort of like uh, sort of like uh, nail polish. But you know what? I said, please, give me one of those. And uh, she said, do you want it heated up? And I said, uh, no, thanks. You, you either like butter buns or you don't. I said something I wasn't, <laughs> something that didn't need to be said. But you know what? That's what I said. And, uh, and I uh, paid her for it there. And uh, just decided to sit at the counter, which is just a few feet away, instead of the regal table I was at. And uh, my waitress from just before came by as I sat down with the f with the fork and the knife and the napkin. And she said, oh, look at you. And I just said, uh, you know what? Please bring me a skim milk, a large one. And it can, can be to go just in a, in a plastic or wax cup and a straw. And she said... Uh, Whoa, we don't have skim milk. And uh, she, then she said, uh, we have non-fat milk. And uh, I said, all right. You know, and for a second I thought, aren't those the same thing? And But but there's no sense. Yeah, I didn't want to say something like that. And I said, bring me one of those, please. And you know what? I not only had a great meal there on my own uh, with two lovely waitresses there smiling but I had a dessert at the counter, a butter bun, and it was mighty good, and a glass of non-fat slash skimmed milk. And folks, I walked back to the car with the rest of that milk in the wax cup, and it was pretty good. But I, I agree with what Colonel Jeff said. Anchovies get a bad rap. They didn't have them there, but I think anchovies are terrific, and it reminded me of the best meal I ever had. Now, you've read that sometimes where they say of uh, people, 
oh, actors or athletes or designers or whatever they want. Hey, what's the best meal you ever had? And I know what it was. In high school, my friends Jimmy Kaufman and Kenny Kapner and, uh, well, Kenny Noodleman. It was Richie Kapner and Kenny Noodleman. And I know sometimes people, his whole life, people have chuckled at that name, Noodleman. But let me tell you something, folks. He was not only a great athlete, but a terrific fella, a good friend. And he had three older sisters all in one batch. He had the, the sisters were triplets, and they were identical triplets, and they were very pretty. The Noodleman girls, if you said that, that was a real compliment. They were all beautiful, and they were all really fit, good athletes. And they were all, well, they were very womanly. They had great figures, and they were all cheerleaders in our high school. Does that say enough, by the way? Anyone need anything more there? And uh, when they came out, when all the cheerleaders came out, well, it's always that way with cheerleaders, but when the Noodleman girls came running out with the pom-poms, just pom-poms, and uh, they would start jumping and dancing away. There wasn't one guy in the stands who wasn't looking at them. And uh, you know what, though? So the four of us used to go to this local pizza parlor when one guy got old enough to have a car and uh, or borrow his parents' car. And we would go to this uh, pizza place, Vinny's, Vinny's Pizza. And not too far, I guess it was a, oh, a, mile, a couple of miles away, a mile and a half, two miles and we went there every night on summer because the fellows there, Vinny and all the family, all the all the, the man fellows there, uh, used to close up about 10, 10.30. And then they would just go themselves, sit down in the back and play cards. It was a game called Beast or Beasta. I don't, I can't, no, never really learn the, learn the name fully. But it was a gambling game, too, and there was always $5 or $8 or something more in the pot there. And they would do that, and, uh, well, we liked them, and they liked us. They didn't mind us coming. We'd just sit there and watch them play. And then eventually they would, you know, say, hey, why don't you, you want to play, too? And we said, oh, okay, sure. And so we'd put in whatever it was, 2 or $3 to start the game. But then, folks... Uh, their uncle, Zio, and I don't know, Zio may be Italian for uncle. I don't know that either. But, folks, Zio would get up. No one asked him to. No one interrupted anything. And he would get up about 1130 to make us all a bite to eat. No one said, hey, I'm hungry. What do you have? And it wasn't pizza. I can understand that. I think you can too. They just spent their whole day, good Lord, a 14-hour day making and selling pizza. But Zio made something, always the same thing no one had asked, and he always did it the same way. And it was the best meal I ever had. He would take a fresh loaf of Italian bread, not like today, not thin, not sort of uh, two or three inches in diameter, but this was, well... This was Italian bread. They were big and thick. They were sort of like, uh, well, the thick end of a baseball bat or, uh, or a strong fella's bicep. And it was always ooh, about five feet long, these things. And he would cut it. He was very good in the kitchen there, and he would just go shunk and cut it all the way down. And then he did two things. He took, there was a can of butter a big industrial can. That's how they got their butter. And he took, there was a big can. It was all nicely melted, not over melted, but he would take one of those uh, spoons that had been hammered out and he just went through the can there. Whoa, he took a big clop of butter out of it and started buttering the bread on both sides. And I mean, he was buttering it. This was This wasn't just a little schmear of butter or a little tiny coating of butter. This was a good quarter inch thick hunk of butter over the whole bread. So that was great bread and great butter on it 
and lots of both. And then he picked up another can, folks, and I'm telling you, this was a can of anchovies. Not a little can, not like for sliced carrots. I mean, this was another industrial-sized can, about a foot in diameter and about a foot and a half deep. And folks, he reached in there and pulled out the best anchovies in the world. And he would pull them out with the sauce, the olive oil or whatever is on them, still on them, and he would go pick out a handful and just whap, just toss it into the bread, and another handful, whap, 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 along the whole length of that five-foot Italian bread. And then he would, uh, you know, push the two sides together and pick up a really frightening-looking, well, uh, a butcher's axe for, not for meat, for the butcher. And, uh, but, I mean, he would take that thing, it was like a pretty big blade, and he would just, he was good with it. He would cut cut that thing up by whack, 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 just right down a big piece for everyone and put them on small white plates and put them on the table for everyone and just got everyone an ice-cold Coke to go with it. And I don't mean a can or a bottle. I mean he used the Coke tap there and would fill up pitchers and give you a glass full of ice, the way you always want it but never get it. And I mean full, from the bottom of the glass to the top. And we would take a minute from the card game, and boy, oh boy, we would put napkins in our laps and pick up that bread. And I'm telling you folks, that was the best meal I ever had. You take a bite into that thing, you you didn't think about anything else. You, You didn't think... Well, is it salty? Is it not salty? Zio had just made it, and you were going to eat it, and happily. And I'm telling you, that was the greatest thing I ever had. Then you'd take a big sip of Coke and whew, just lean back, and then, mm, mm, mm. Then you'd dig back into that hero sandwich with the butter and the anchovies and just chomp. Holy mackerel, that was good. Take a couple of big chomps, wipe your mouth on one of their nice napkins, and uh, and back into the Coke. I'm telling you, those were Zio's anchovy heroes. And if anyone ever asks, you and I have both been lucky enough to have some, well, we've had some good meals in our lives. And sometimes they're pretty fancy, I guess, and... Sometimes they're pr- they're plain, but there's nothing better I've ever had in my life than one of Zio's anchovy heroes. And uh, we liked him a lot. We liked all those fellows a lot. Sure, Zio got mad every once in a while and almost killed one of my friends, but you know what? That's another story for another time. <laughs> but today... Well, I guess I never forgot the word anchovy then, not when Zio made it. And by the way, is it, is it just a salty fish that sits in olive oil and a brine, whatever that means? We didn't even mind that Zio just rammed his huge hands into that can. No one ever thought, you know, shouldn't he wash first or something? We didn't, ooh, no one thought anything. He just had gigantic hands. And boy, you could hear those anchovies hit that bread. Thwack. Mmm. Boy, and and plus, as Colonel Jeff pointed out, whatever those things were brined in must have made his hands the cleanest they were all day. Or his entire life. So, what was in that brine? God only knows. And anchovies could be a great addition to anything. Let's be honest. Martinis. Why not? Why not? Why not a really good martini made in a really good glass and then one full anchovy just draped in? Why the heck not? Sandwiches, mac and cheese, why not? They're great. But that's something else anyway. I'll tell you about food that I and Colonel Jeff have made, and then you'll know about it too. As of now, you and I both know 
the important things of life. Homer is Homer, and Pluto is a planet. And remember, folks, as always... If you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a home to come back to and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. Remember that. And we'll see you here next time. Till then, eat some anchovies. <laughs> <laughs>